Hi guys, Dr. Gillard here. Thanks for coming over to another video. This is a very special video, how to read your cervical MRI. Uh, I've been wanting to do this for a long time and I had a week off uh, between my winter and spring quarters. And so I spent the last four days putting this together for you. And if you can get through this and understand this, I guarantee you will know how to read cervical MRIs. Uh, for you primary healthcare providers, I have a lot of followers. With that regard, this is going to be really valuable to you uh, because you can't rely on radiology reports, right? They're not that accurate. There's research on that. I have it posted on my chirogeek.com. Uh, so you got to be able to see things with your own eyes. So this will be a good, uh, a good overview for you. What are we going to do? Uh, so we're going to start out talking about body planes, uh, coronal, what's a coronal cut, what's a sagittal cut, what's an axial cut. And as I go through, we're going to show you uh, using real human bones, what we're looking at. And then I'm going to show you CT images and CT myelogram images and then MRI images. So I'm going to start teaching you right away. Uh, and we're going to build. And then after this video, I just finished making one where you and I are going to go over my cervical MRI. And we're going to use all the techniques and the new stuff that you learned in this video to, to kind of put things all together. So anyway, now disclaimer, this is for educational purposes only, right? I'm not trying to interfere with any doctor-patient relationship. Um, and you don't ever use what I teach you here to second guess your radiologist. If you have a question about your MRI, you call your radiology center and ask them. Or you can call me or email me and we can set up a coaching session. We can go through your cervical MRI together and I can see how good you've gotten at reading your uh, your imaging. Okay, so I'm going to put my head down and get to work on this PowerPoint presentation and I really hope you like it. All right, here we go. How to read your cervical MRI. But first, let me do a quick plug for my coaching service business. So as you may or may not know, I do make myself available to the general public uh, for patients who have chronic pain and it's just not getting better and they don't know what to do. My bread and butter case is the patient has went to a spine surgeon and the surgeon has said, yep, we got to set you up for surgery in two weeks. And they've spent five minutes with, with the patient. They didn't show the patient their MRIs. The patient doesn't know what's the matter, what the surgeon's going to do, or why they're going to do it. And I get a lot of cases like that. I also get a lot of cases where... Uh, the patient has been to three, four, even five surgeons, and they've all said something different, and they're really confused on what to do. So they want someone without a, a dog in the fight, so to speak, uh, who's been doing this a long time and can give them a neutral opinion based on the medical literature database. And, yep, I really enjoy that. So if you're interested, just send me an email at chirogeek at chirogeek.com, or you can go, if you want to learn more, you can go to my website, chirogeek.com, go to the coaching tab right here, and it'll you can read all about the coaching service. Uh, but send me an email and give me one paragraph about what's going on and how I can help you. Um, don't you know, don't write a book. I don't need to, to read that. I just need just like one paragraph. And we'll get into everything that's going on during the coaching session, but I don't need that in an initial email. I get a lot of emails, so I really appreciate you being concise and to the point. Um, and then, yeah, and then I'll get back to you and tell you whether or not I think you're a good candidate for the coaching. And please if, please check out my testimonial page. I have some wonderful testimonials from uh, some many, many different professions, from pastors to emergency room physician, physical therapist, federal judge, physician. I have several physician testimonials, professor, veterinarian, several chiropractic testimonials, several engineers, orthopedic nerd, uh, knee surgeon, Navy pilot, several different lawyers. Uh, so I have, and then just run of the mill uh, housewives and just just normal people uh, as well. Uh, so go check those out if you have any doubt. All right, with that said, let's get back to this how to read your cervical MRI. Also, if you have a lumbar MRI, uh, this is not going to be for you, although it's similar. Uh, but I do have a dedicated how to read your lumbar MRI video. Uh, just go to Google, uh, go to YouTube and, and type in Dr. Gillard, or just type in how to read your MRI, Dr. Gillard, and my video will pop right up. 
right? Now we're going to start out with some medical directional language, basically the body planes. If you want to understand more about that, here's a video. Uh, again, go to YouTube and type in Dr. Gillard medical directional language, and this one will pop up, and you can get into the weeds a little more on this. I'm going to teach you the basics, though, and let's actually do that right now, the body planes. Um, so, and you should you should understand some other basic terms. Basically, this is the anatomical position of the body. To the front is anterior. That's the word we use to the front or ventral. To the back is posterior or dorsal. Uh, toward the top is superior or cranial. I won't use that word for you, but toward the bottom is caudal or inferior. Uh, lateral means toward the side, away from the midline of the body. The midline would be a line, like your spine is pretty much the midline of the body. Lateral is away from that. Toward the, toward the midline of the body is medial. And I think most of you know that. Go to that video, that uh, medical direction language, if you were confused on that. You definitely need to know these planes, though. Uh, so we can put slices through the human body. So if I slice you like this green plane is going here, uh, that's called an axial plane, and there's AKAs for that. A hat or chat is the for the all the AKAs. Cross-sectional, horizontal, axial, transverse are all the same. In radiology speak, they always use axial, so that's what we'll talk about. Now, if we put a plane like this, I guess that's an orange color, kind of, kind of running down like this. I don't know if I'll be you'll see me on this, uh, but. Um, that is called a sagittal plane, specifically if it goes right through your nose, that's a mid-sagittal plane. Uh, off to the side, maybe through your trap, in the same plane, that's a parasagittal plane. Uh, and then if we put a plane like the pink one here, going through the shoulders, uh, that's called a coronal plane. Coronal plane. And let's talk. Let's kind of expand on that now. Now, there is some grossness here. we got some cadaver slices coming up. So if you're sensitive, you might want to not watch this video, or at least not watch the next few slides, right? So how do you how do you make axial an axial plane? Uh, specifically, you if this was a tree, your body was a tree, and you wanted to cut the tree down to see the rings, and took a chainsaw and sawed right through the tree, uh, you would get you would get this look. So here's a Here's a body sliced up into a million pieces via Photoshop. Uh, and these are called axial cuts. Axial cuts. Now, we can make the axial cuts by standing from the side. We can make them from standing in the front. And this will make more sense later. But we can make them several different ways. But we can't view them very well standing off to the side or standing from the front or even standing from the back. To view the work or to view these cuts you have to go from overhead or underneath right so if i pulled one of these slabs or these cuts out and threw it on the table we can look at it from overhead and that's called an axial cut that's a vertebrae and we'll get into that just kind of wetting your appetite for this stuff okay and that's the way mri works we can use one image to select a cut and see that cut on the other half of your screen. Right? So for example, this is kind of a coronal view. We can use the coronal view to select a cut that the MRI machine has made, and then we can view that, on the, split the screen in half, on the other half we can view that cut as an axial cut. And you, that'll make more sense. I'm just whetting your appetites now. Okay? Uh, now here's the gross stuff. So, sagittal cut. So this time, uh, we're standing right in front of the person and we're cutting them. I'll take the chainsaw, if you will. It's a terrible analogy, but you'll remember it. You chop them down in the center like this, right through. Now I could stand, uh, no, to make sagittal cuts, you have to stand either in front of them. You could go overhead and make cuts as well, uh, but the cuts have to be in this plane. And now you can see a three dimensional plane of a mid sagittal cut. You can see the brain and the tongue is split in half here, and you can see the cervical spine is split in half. So that's the mid-sagittal cut. But the same point, just because we're standing in front of this person to make the cuts, we can't really see them like that. To see them, you have to go around to the sides from a lateral view or from a sagittal plane. So these types of, they're, they're called sagittal cuts because you can only see them in the sagittal plane. But they're made 
uh, from from A to P uh, or from S to I or I to S. And that'll make more sense when we get to that. Um, so there's a sagittal cut, a mid-sagittal cut. That's an MRI. You can see the bones. And we'll get into all that here in a second. And then we have coronal cuts. We're not going to show you too many of these. A lot of times the cervicals don't include coronal cuts. Um, but uh, now you have to stand either from the side of the patient and put the cuts, you know, kind of make the chainsaw go up and down here. Or you could go overhead and do this as well. But these would be the, and these are called cut lines. And these thicknesses are cut, the thicknesses of cut. I'll talk about three millimeter cuts as the standard. Uh, you shouldn't have five millimeter cuts. Those are too wide. So the, the, the width of these cuts is important. All right? Uh, but see, this cut right here uh, is about the cut that you can see on this cadaver. This is a plastinated cadaver here. Okay, so these are called coronal cuts. Coronal cuts are viewed from the front. Or you could say they can be viewed from behind as well. They're not viewed from the side, though. They're made from the side. Right? So here's an example of a spine, a coronal a slice of the cervical spine. Right? And we'll, pretty soon you'll understand what all these bones are. All right, is that good? So if you're confused on that, watch it again or go back and watch that more uh, medical directional language video will help you with that. Now let's get into the anatomy. So we have to do some uh, anatomy here, right? Because you won't understand what you're looking at if you don't know what the bones are. Right, you've got to understand this stuff. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll, as we go here, I'm not just using bones. I'm going to be using images as well. So you're going to be learning MRI and, and CT right now as you go along, now that you understand the cuts and the body planes. All right, and this is an advanced video if you want to go into the weeds and the cervical spine. Here's an hour and 40 minute video that's purely dedicated to the cervical spine. Everything you could ever possibly want to know about the cervical spine is right here. All right, so what is the cervical spine anyway? Let's start with the basics. It's the neck bones. So these are the bones that are inside the middle of your neck. Uh, you could say it's between the skull and the thoracic spine. And they're made of building blocks. So here's some building blocks stock, stacked on top of one another. Now what's not drawn here uh, is a disc. So there would be an intervertebral disc separating each, each of these bones. And that's an important concept because many of you listening right now have disc herniations. And so we'll talk a little bit about what that is. Uh, but yep, yeah, so that's the deal with that. Now, they're, they're not just stacked willy-nilly. They're stacked in a special way. And so what is the stacking confirmation or stacking arrangement? Uh, from an A to P view, like, looking, like you're looking at me right now from the anterior to posterior, uh, you should, the bones should be stacked straight. They shouldn't be crooked. If you stack them, if you view from the side, like if, I, if you're viewing this way, um, there should be a, a curve, a lordotic curve associated with those, right? Um, and this lordotic curve could be said to be conve convex anterior to posterior, or concave posterior to anterior. Let's take a look at that. Uh, so let me get my drawing tools out again. Uh, so here is a cartoon of a lateral view or a sagittal view of this, of this human. And you can see there is a little curve right here. On this CT scan over here, you can really see a much more normal curve. The drawing should be curved more. Um, this is to the anterior, right? The nose is anterior. There's the base, the hairline there. That's posterior. Um, how do you tell on a CT lateral or an MRI lateral which way's forward, which way's back? Here's a, a pro tip. Uh, you can look for this little weird bone, this peg. See, this is a very strange bone. Most of the bones are like those building blocks I showed you, except for C2 has this peg called the odontoid process. Uh, that's sticking out, uh, and that is always forward. Uh, the, if you see that, you should see another piece of bone back here. Uh, then you should see the vertebral foramen right here. And so, And this will make more sense as we go through. So look for that dance. Or you could look for all this black. This is air. Uh, so this is the oral pharynx and laryngopharynx, which is filled with air. Here's the trachea down here. So that's another way to tell the front. That's always, of course, your Adam's apple, 
The, right underneath that is your trachea, and that's filled with air, and air shows up black uh, on CT imaging and on MRI imaging. Right? So that's the lordosis there. You could say from an A to P view that it's convex, or from a P to A view, it should be concave. And in any regard, this is called a lordotic curve. That's very, very important for normal biomechanics. And I took a bunch of slides out because it was way too long, but I showed you some abnormal biomechanics and how that can mess things up. It could cause osteoarthritis, it can cause fractures, it can cause disc herniations when this is messed up. But I'm not going to get it. I'm just trying to get you to read these things. We're not talking about pathology today. All right. So this is a coronal view. So this is looking at me right straight on. And here's a great, uh, I demonstrated my amazing Photoshop skills where I Photoshopped a real cervical spine in about where it would be anatomically. And this is a straight spine. It shouldn't be crooked. And here's one of my patients also demonstrating uh, a four-level ACDF. And it's pretty straight. It's not perfectly straight, but it's pretty. It's much better than it used to be. Okay? Right? Here is another uh, A to P and lateral. So this is an MRI series. A little bit harder to, to, to read MRI than it compared to CT. It looks just like anatomy. But you can see there's a coronal cut right through the vertebral bodies. And you can see the spine is nice and straight. And this is a sagittal cut also through the vertebral bodies, and we can see that there is a curve. It's actually a little straight here, uh, but it's still a pretty decent curve. It's not reversed. I mean, some people's curves, they go backwards like that. Uh, and I had some images. If you want to watch that really long video, I put that in and talk about that. All right, so now let's meet the blocks. Let's meet the vertebrae that make up these curves. So we have atypical vertebrae and typical vertebrae. The atypical ones we're not going to talk too much about because things usually don't go wrong up there very often. That's atlas and axis. We'll look at those at the end. But the typical cervical vertebrae are the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh cervical vertebrae. That's the end of the cervical spine. There's only seven blocks. Uh, then it starts the thoracic spine. And C for cervical, so these are called C1, or C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. So C7 is a little weird. It's not perfectly typical. It's a little atypical, but it's generally clumped in there with the typical cervical vertebrae. And here's a C5 and C6, typical vertebrae from the front. So this is a anterior to posterior view. Uh, we'll talk about all these parts here in a little bit, but basically an important concept is a motion segment. So this is a cervical motion segment. Motion segment is a top bone, a intervertebral disc, and a bottom bone sandwiched together. This is the functional unit of the spine. That applies to the thoracic and lumbar spine as well. Uh, here's a P to A, or a from behind view, of atlas and axis, and now you can see that little peg. And I won't go say anything more about these because we're going to dig into them a little bit. So from an overhead view, the typical cervical vertebrae really have two main parts. They have a vertebral body, which is a block, kind of a rectangle of bone in the front. And then there's an arch of bone behind. And it literally is an arch of bone, so it creates a hole right here, a very important hole called the vertebral foramen. And collectively, these vertebral foramen make up the vertebral canal, uh, which is a bony hole or passageway for the spinal cord, the delicate spinal cord, or in the lumbar spine, the cauda coina. Um, there is a sac around here as well. I guess we'll show you that right now. So we can use blue. Uh, there is a sac of dura mater called the thecal sac, or the dural sac, which is important. And that, dur that dural sac is filled with cerebrospinal fluid, which bathes and nourishes the spinal cord and the cauda equina as well. So that's an important concept, that fecal sac. So I'm getting off base a little, because this is a simple slide. Vertebrae, two parts. Vertebral body, arch of bone. 
called the vertebral arch or the neural arch sometimes. You shouldn't call this a posterior arch though. That's reserved for C1 only. All right. So here's an overhead view of a typical cervical vertebrae and we can clearly see the vertebral body right here and then get my drawing tools out again uh, we can see the arch. Uh, technically the arch starts right here that's kind of the roof of the vertebral frame in if you will. The arch is connected to the bone by this or connected to the vertebral body by this uh, that's called the pedicle. I'm getting ahead of my slides though. but basically these are the two parts. Right? Now, what are the parts of the vertebral arch? Uh, so let's just jump over to the pedicle. You can read through that if you want. Or let's just jump over to the next slide and look. Um, so we have, there's our vertebral body, there's our vertebral arch, but now we can break that vertebral arch down into pieces. So the pedicle is the strongest part of the, of the vertebrae period. Uh, it's said to connect the vertebral body with the vertebral arch. The vertebral arch is made up of the articular pillars, which we will look at individually. These are coming in and out of the plane of the page. It's a pillar of bone. It also contains the, makes up the facet joint, which is really important. Then we have a lamina. Uh, and then we repeat on the other side, lamina, articular pillar, and pedicle. All right, so it's a pretty simple, uh, simple concept. All right, here's a CT image. Somebody tell me what type of image, what type of cut this is. Is it a axial cut, a sagittal cut, or a coronal cut? Now we're looking down at the block here. This is the same cut as that. So this is an overhead cut called an axial cut. Uh, and we can see the parts. There's the pedicle in blue. Uh, there's the articular pillar. Now it's just a cut. It's only two or three millimeters thick. So there's no three-dimensionality to this. Uh, but, but we could keep going. We could cut down deeper and deeper, and this, this articular pillar would keep going where the pedicle wouldn't. We'll understand more in a minute when we get to that part. And there's the lamina there. Okay, so pretty straightforward. Here's an MRI. See, this is why I introduced CT to you. It's easier to teach, teach CT than it is MRI. Uh, but we can still see... The MRI. Here's the vertebral body, of course, uh, and here's the pedicle. So this means it's a cut. This is an axial cut through the pedicles. Okay, there's the pedicle. Articular pillar would be right here. Here's the lamina. That's pretty easy to see. Okay, and then it repeats over here. Here's the other lamina. Great. And here's the thecal sac. You can see the black right here. That's the thecal sac, which is that sac that, hand, that, that holds all that white stuff, that cerebral spinal fluid. We'll learn that this is a T2-weighted image. That's why we can see, uh, see the water so nicely. Uh, and yeah. Now we have some projections we can talk about real quickly coming off what we've learned so far. We have transverse processes which stick out on each side. They kind of face forward about 45 degrees. I could have made them go forward a little bit further. And then there's a spinous process. So this thing kind of looks like an airplane from an overhead view. Unique to the cervical spine, these are bifid. These are split spinous processes, which is nowhere else in the body. And these are also split transverse processes. There's an anterior and posterior strut, which is not seen anywhere else in the body. So here's a real bone that we can see overhead. And you can see there's the anterior strut, posterior strut. This whole structure is the transverse process. The pedicle would be right here. Pedicle. Here's the articular pillar. You can see how that makes up a piece of the, the vertebral arch. Here's the lamina. Here's the other lamina, articular pillar pedicle. Got it? Now if we move over to a, this is a slice through the pedicles again, it's an axial slice, a CT, which is easy to see. Uh, we can easily see there's the anterior strut of the transverse process, posterior strut, there's the spinous process, and we have went over all those other parts enough. I think you can figure that out. These are the vertebral foramen, or they're called transverse foramen. 
the vertebral artery runs through here, and I'm not going to get into the weeds on that. You can watch that other video if you want to learn more about that. That's usually not clinically. Occasionally it can be clinically significant, but usually not. So we don't need to talk about it. All right. So there's just another picture. This is C7. It does not have a bifid spinous process. And yeah, uh, another cut through the pedicles, and you can see the transverse process. You can see the spinal cord. You can even see the nerve roots here. Okay, now this is an important concept. The articular pillars, and this always confuses students. Uh, so we have to look from the side of the vertebrae. Uh, really, this is kind of a from the front, from the side, kind of a oblique view, it's called because I can see the neural foramen here. Uh, but this is the articular pillar, this whole thing right here. And it looks like a pillar of bone, right? The tops and bottoms of these articular pillars, they come together to form a joint, right? Just like your thigh bone comes together with your leg bone to form the knee joint, same deal here. Your superior articular process, which is right here, comes together with your inferior articular process. Uh, so I should, I should back up and explain that this is the articular pillar, but it's made up of two parts. If we cut it in half here, this is called the superior articular process. This is called the inferior articular process. All right, so that's the articular pillar. Why do we care about this articular pillar? It's a big deal about that. If you get arthritis and get a degenerative bone spur, sometimes you can get these little points of bone that come out like that, and they can stab the nerve root. Uh, there's a nerve root that comes out of here and goes down your arms, and you can get stabbed by this arthritic change of the articular pillar. Specifically, it's usually the superior articular process that dumps that. So here's a coronal view. There's that pillar of bone again. That's we always know that C2. Uh, and you can see this is a cut. So my cut line, which we'll talk about, cut line would go like this. This is the slice I'm looking at. If I threw that slice over here uh, and looked at it from the front, this is what I'd see. And we can see the articular pillar. And this is a superior articular process, inferior articular process, but the whole thing is called the articular pillar. And the articular pillars make up these super important facet joints, which we'll talk about more officially in a second. Everybody got it? So here is a MRI cut through the articular pillars. Sometimes they're hard to see, but you can see them. Get my drawing tools out again. Right Here's an inferior articular process, superior articular process, and you can see where they come together it forms a real joint. So these are the joints of your spine called the facet joints or the zygapotheceal joints are, is the real word for those or the Z joints. Everybody in the, in the real world calls them facet joints. Are we good? Okay. Now the facet joints, as we've talked about a little already, they're super clinically important because they're a real diarthroidal joint. Okay. So that means that... Uh, it's a real joint. There's an inferior articular process and a superior articular process. Uh, it has articular cartilage on it. There's articular cartilage, just like your knee has articular cartilage and a meniscus. It doesn't have a meniscus, but it has articular cartilage, which is a pad that, that protects the delicate bone underneath. If you wear a hole in this pad, you're going to get really, really bad facet joint pain, just like someone who's worn out their knees. They've worn the cartilage away in their knees. You can do that with a facet joints, and you can get horrible pain, which sometimes the only treatment is to fuse those together so they don't rub on each other anymore. There's no joint replacement that you can do uh, for the facet joints. Okay, And yeah, there's the synovial membrane that... that Lap, laps over the top or loops over the top and secretes synovial fluid. So there's like a little oil in here to keep these joints nice and slippery. But yeah, all kinds of things that can go wrong with them. So there's a cartoon. They have a capsule around them so the synovial fluid doesn't leak out. Uh, so a real point, important concept. There's that same picture uh, in reality in the body uh, that would 
I mean, you would see like a tough capsule around here. You wouldn't see the joint like that. If you poked a hole in the capsule, the fluid would run out of it. Got it? All right, and there's nociceptors in there as well. Uh, they, they're just like your knee joint has pain fiber in it, so does the facet joint. And specifically, they're supplied by the, the medial branch of the posterior ramus. You've, some of you have had medial branch blocks, right? Oh, you know that word. Uh, and because it's the medial branch of the posterior ramus that carries the sense of, the sense of nociception or the sense of pain. And this is one of the big causes of chronic pain or problems with that facet joint. Either the articular cartilage has worn away, that synovium can get trapped inside the joint and cause pain. The facet joint capsule can get caught inside the joint and cause pain. Okay, So let's do a little neural anatomy. I'm not going to go crazy again. You can go to that other video if you want to go into the weeds on this. Uh, but this is, there's our articular pillar. There's our facet joint. This is the hole we're going to talk about next. Um, so I could have waited, but I'm going to talk about it right now instead. This is the exiting nerve root right here. You can, In general, this is the exiting nerve root. It's actually made up of several parts that we can talk about. And let me get my marker out here. Uh, so anteriorly, we have a motor root right here. Posteriorly, we have a sensory root. That carries the sensation. If you hit your thumb with a hammer, the signals go into your brain go that direction into the spinal cord. And if you want to pull your hand away from a hot flame, the muscles that do that, uh, the brain orders it, the, the signals going that way through these nerve roots. And there's tiny little roots within here, um, right? These are just covers for, for thousands of things called axons. But anyway, there's the dorsal root ganglia. That's kind of the brain of the sensory root. From here to here, in this cartoon, is the official spinal nerve. The spinal nerve is always named by the, the bottom member of the motion segment. And we'll see in a minute that this hole called the neural foramen or the inner vertebral foramen is formed by C5 and C6. This nerve always gets the name of the bottom member of the motion segment. So that's the C6 spinal nerve. Then that splits into a ventral ramus. So that goes down into your brachial plexus and, and forms uh, some of the, the big nerves, the median nerve. Um, so that goes to the brachial plexus and will eventually go all the way down your arm. Then we have some nerves going to the posterior. So this is called the posterior ramus. Posterior ramus splits uh, into a lateral branch, which is coming out of the plane of the page. It goes to some of the neck muscles. And then there's the important medial branch. Medial branch splits, and it supplies the facet joint with nociception and proprioception. So it gives you a little bit of balance function. Is, but more importantly, this is where the signal of pain will travel through this medial branch. There's an upper branch and lower branch. The lower branch goes into the, the Z joint or the facet joint below. Uh, so pain management doctors have to block both of these if they're going to do a rhizotomy. It can be pretty tricky. Okay, and sometimes there's an intermediate branch, but um, yeah, so that's your neural anatomy. Um, you know, play that back and think about that a few times. Clinically, I mean, the bottom line is the nerve, the delicate nerve runs through this neural foramen, uh, and it's delicate. If it gets pinched or poked by bones, remember we said a bone spur can grow off the superior articular process and stab it. You're going to have horrible pain down your arms. You're going to be dropping things. You might be able to... The, your keyboard and mousing might be a trouble. You could have burning pain on the skin. Uh, and it could be it could be a bone spur. Could be a disc herniation could pinch it. An uncinate process spur could pinch it. There's three things that could pinch it right there. All right, but that's not the goal of this video. Okay, we've talked about it. Let's talk about it officially. So the neural foramen are those little holes that we just looked at. They're on the anterior lateral side of the leg. They're formed by two, the members of the motion segment coming together. Super clinically important, as I just said, because the nerves can get pinched as they come out. And there's the official view of it is right there. We kind of already talked about it. Um, it does have some borders, so this is a nerd alert. You don't have to know all this, but I mean the superior articular process is a big one because you can get bone spurs and stab the nerve there. But the inferior articular process is the border, posterior border. 
The vertebral body is an anterior border. The disc is an anterior border. This thing, which we'll talk about, is called the uncinate process, is an anterior border. Um, so those are important. The pedicle. The pedicles make up the roof and the floor. Um, so this is the pedicle right here. Right? So that's the floor. The other pedicle is here. It's kind of the transverse process is blocking your view. All right? And we won't talk. I mean, there's a superior and inferior vertebral notch. We don't have to worry about that. My students do, though. All right. And there's, we've already discussed these structures, but you can see how the nerve comes out. And, um, yeah, it's a very clinically important thing. On an overhead view, it's harder to see the neural foramen, um, but we can try to draw it in so the neural foramen or the intervertebral foramen would be right here. Well, how do I know? Because there's a superior articular process coming out of the plane of the page, so I know that's the back end of the neural foramen. And there's the unsnake process and part of the disc making up the anterior border. So this region right here is the, the neural foramen. All right, and you can see how the nerves, a better drawing of the nerves, you can see the anterior ramus and the posterior ramus here. They just, they didn't draw the splits. All right, and you can see the delicate spinal cord here as well. Got it? All right. Um, so there's another picture. You can see the neural foramen quite nicely here um, on this. This is a CT scan. See how we can, we can look at these slices and see. Here's an MRI. This is, now what view is this? No, it's not axial. It's not coronal. This is a side view. There's the dens to the side, and there's the anterior tubercle of atlas. Um, so this is a sagittal view. You can't see, you can't see the neural foramen on a coronal view or on, really on an axial view. You can't see whole, real holes like this. Only a sagittal, or better yet, an oblique view. You can see those. So here's an overhead view of an MRI, and again, you can see the neural foramen right here. Quite nicely. Spinal cord, fecal sac with cerebrospinal fluid, disc, spinous process, lamina. Got it? See, you're learning how to read your MRIs already. We're not even to that part yet. All right, here's another oblique series you can see. Um, again, this is, uh, I was going to take this out because I didn't want to get into this. So, uh, this patient has a tumor on one of the nerves. See how big the, the, the tumor is? In the hole, there's a hole there, a hole there. They kind of fade out here. They have a little scoliosis, so you can't quite see them. But Are we good? Okay, the last thing to talk about, and we've talked about it already, is this vertebral canal that's made by this arch of bone. Uh, it's got a roof. So the roof is the lamina, basically, in the articular pillars. And it's got a floor. The floor is the vertebral bodies and the disc, and then the sides of the pedicles. Who cares about the vertebral canal? Well, I took these slides out, but people can get stenosis in here. If you get a big disc herniation or a big disc bulge that goes back like this, there's the disc, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then you get ligamentum flavum thickening back here, you can start to smash the fecal sac and smash the spinal cord down flat. And that's a really common. I have many clients with that problem with the myelopathy. So you can watch the other video if you want to get into that, because that's a long, long one. This is long enough. All right, so there's the vertebral canal. I think we've talked about everything there already. Another mid-sagittal slice of the vertebral canal. Nice lordosis. Everything's great. Okay, overhead views of the vertebral canal. Now, what views are these? Tell me what views these are. Good, they're axial views. And this is a CT. This is a little tricky. This is a CT myelogram. So all this white is cerebral, would be cerebrospinal fluid, but normally you wouldn't see this on a CT scan. The only, only reason we could see it is because they've injected contrast into the, into the canal or into the thecal sac. This is an intrathecal injection. And we can see it because of that. So there's the spinal cord. We can see the nerve roots. There's the motor root right here. There's the sensory root toward the back. You can see them on both sides. Um, and yep. Yeah. So this is an axial MRI. 
and you can see cerebrospinal fluid, but you can also see fat. This is epidural fat here as well, so sometimes it's a little bit harder to see. But, I mean, this is the gold standard of CT myelogram. If you can't figure something out, you always order one of these. You don't like to, though, because it's radiation. Okay, another one is the uncinate processes and the importance of the onchovertebral joints. So uncinate processes look like Batman's ears. They stick up from the, the anterior lateral part of typical cervical vertebrae. I think we can just look at a picture here. So this is an oblique view of a bone, C5 cervical vertebrae, and it's got these weird Batman ears sticking up. No other bones have those, and those are called uncinate processes. And notice that the uncinate process actually makes up the front part of the neuroforamen where the nerve is. Uh, so the, if you get a bone spur off here, you can stab the nerve root here. Here's the superior articular process. We talked about a bone spur there. But both of these bone spurs off, either one of these can stab the nerve root and cause horrible arm pain in people. Okay, so it's clinically important. So it meets, there's a better drawing, there's the articular pillar. Um, here's another, another view of it. You can see there's the uncinate process and this real human bones here. Um, it, there's a facet that it meets right here called the facet for the uncinate process. Together, the uncinate process and the facet for the uncinate process make a real diarthroidal joint. It's a semi-diarthroidal joint has synovial fluid in it, but not as much as a normal joint. It does have pain fiber in it, um, so it's capable of producing pain. And that's called the onchovertebral joint. The onchovertebral joint, a.k.a. the joints of von Luschka. Uh, and they can be, they can cause trouble. Here's another view. You can see uncinate processes here. And there's the facet for the uncinate process would be right here. And they have a capsule over them, just like a facet joint. And um, yeah, uh, cervical spine is the only place that has these, these Lushka joints. You don't have them in your thoracic or lumbar spine. The thought to help stabilize the cervical spine a little bit when you bend to the side, because there's no ribs to help, and these bones are tiny. So that's thought to be the purpose of it. Okay, Just to show you, if we draw the nerve in there, you can see how close the nerve is to the unsnate process. All right, let's get into the intervertebral disc now, which is really important. A lot of my clients have disc herniations, and probably some of you watching have disc herniations. So, uh, and I'm not going to go into the weeds. Again, go to that video if you want to go into the weeds on this stuff. But um, So here's a coronal view from the front. You can see the discs between all the vertebrae, right? There's no discets between C1 and C2, though. That's a noteworthy uh, thing there. The disc is made up of an annulus fibrosus and a nucleus propulsus. So here's a classic cartoon of it. So here's the nucleus propulsus. It's made up of proteoglycan molecules. The cells make proteoglycans, which grab water, so it's about 80% water. And this squishy, it's like a toothpaste consistency. It's held in place by these really strong rings of type 1 collagen. They're called lamellae. And all these lamellae make up a structure called the annulus fibrosis. So for you lay people, just the nucleus is the squishy toothpaste in the middle, and it's held in place by these rings of, of these lamellae, these type 1 super strong, like a steel belted radial tire. Instead of air, you have toothpaste here, but it's these are the steel belts that prevent punctures. To the posterior, we have another set of nerves. This is the number one cause of chronic back pain middle back pain or neck pain, is when these nerve roots get set off or when these nociceptors get set off. Nociceptor is a little pain trigger. It's a little tiny nerve that if you stimulate it, it sends the signal of pain to your brain. And so if these get stimulated, you can have horrible neck pain to the point you have to take the disc out to, uh, to stop the irritation of these things. What causes the disc to, to, what sets these things off usually? Again, I took these slides out because I don't want to make this longer than it's already going to be. But if you get a rip through the annulus fibrosus, that's called an annular tear. 
and I, my website I have talk about annular tears at carrogeek.com car, car website. And I have videos on annular tears. Uh, but if this, this material in the center, the nucleus propulsus, goes through the tear and gets out here, in some people, but not all people, it can spark a horrible inflammation. And once an inflammation occurs, the sensation th that triggers these nociceptors to send pain up to the brain. And the patient says, ouch, my neck is killing me. If it keeps going, sometimes it rips right out and you get, you get a herniation. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a herniation is a, is a continuation. It's a worsening of the annular tear. So you can watch the longer video if you want to get more into the weeds on that. That's all I'm going to say about that because my mission is just to get you to read these things. Um, overhead view, you can see there's the nucleus propulsus. You can see it's really close uh, to especially the motor root right here. Um, so you, again, you can get disc herniation that rips, starts as an annular tear, and then the herniated, the nucleus propulsus can come right out and smash all this and irritate these nerve roots. And then the patient suffers horrible pain down the arm and dysfunction. They can't hold things. They get weak. They can't, they, they don't have fine manipulation anymore. They can't mouse or they can't keyboard and they can't sleep because their arm is burning. It's typically a disc herniation. That's what we're going to look at. You do coaching with me to look at your MRI. That's, those are the things we look for very carefully. Right? Here's the disc from the side. There's the Remember, the disc is named by the bone that sits on top of it. Uh, so here's the C2, right? There's the peg, so we know that's C2. And that's C3. So that's the C2, C2 disc, C3 disc, C4 disc, etc., etc., 5, 6, 7. That's the T1 disc, right? There's the spinal cord right there. The white is cerebrospinal fluid. This is a, what kind of cut? You tell me, what kind of cut? It's a mid-sagittal cut, right? Here's an axial cut uh, where we can see the spinal cord, cerebrospinal fluid. There's the disc right there. And those are the uncinate processes there in white. Those are the vertebral arteries here and here. The neuroforamen, so this is a cut through the neuroforamina. See how that works? Right? Now on a CT scan, the disc is pretty hard to see, isn't it? Now sometimes they'll give you a soft tissue uh, series, which makes it easier to see, but I mean, where's the disc? It's like an x-ray, you can't really see the disc. Uh, you can actually see, if you look really close, you can see a shadow of a herniation right there. But they're really, you know, for lay people, I wouldn't use these. You've got to use your MRI to look for disc herniations. Okay. The disc is named, we already said, by the bone that sits on top of it, so we've covered that already. All right, let's talk just a little bit about atlas and axis. Atlas is C1, it's the top bone. It has no vertebral body, it's very strange. It has two lateral masses, an anterior and a posterior arch, and that's it. It connects to the occiput or to the skull via the occipital condyles. The joint between atlas and axis is called the atlantoaxial occipital joint. The joint between atlas and C2 is called the atlantoaxial joint. My coaching session patients, you guys don't need to know that. Uh, but there it is. Uh, so I can just draw it real quick. So the, this is an overhead view of atlas. It's made up of these two lateral masses, uh, an anterior arch, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, anterior arch and a posterior arch, right? There's the anterior tubercle, which is we can see on CT. The dens would be sitting right here. And then still have transverse process. We don't have a spinous process. We have a posterior tubercle here. But we still have the uh, vertebral foramen right here. Okay? And that's about all I'll say about that. And here it is again. This is an MRI. You can actually see the tongue and the lips. They didn't columnate on this one. The nose is right here. Uh, and you can see there's, there is the dens. The, there's that peg that I told you to look for. And that's always toward the tongue. Or you could look for the black. And that's air 
in the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx here. And this thing, there's the anterior tubercle of atlas. There's the posterior tubercle of atlas. A little bit of posterior arches in there as well. That's all we can see. How come we can't see the whole thing? Well, this is a slice. It's only a two millimeter slice of this image and the lateral masses are out of the plane of the page and into the plane of the page. Got it? Axis has the peg, we've talked about it, called the dens or the odontoid process. It's where you, you can twist and turn your head to the side through that. Uh, there's the bones, the real cadaver bones. Uh, you can see the peg that's sticking up. Embryologically speaking, this is actually the body of Atlas. This is where the body went. I have tons of videos on this. You can go into the weeds if you want on this stuff. I'm not going to go much on it here. Here's a CT slice right through the dens. We can see the lateral masses of Atlas here. And these are the occipital condyles. And these are these two joints. This is the joint. The top of the spine connects to the skull through the atlanto-occipital joint. And the atlas and axis are connected via the atlanto-axial joint. Here's a sagittal, or here's an axial cut. You can see, here's a, that cut would be going, let's see. We got the lateral masses and the atlas there. So that cut would be going just like something like that where we can see the dens, and we can see uh, the lateral mass of atlas. It looks like there's the spinal cord. And that's all I'll say about that. All right, so finally, drum roll. Congratulations, you made it this far. You are ready to get into MRI more. So let's get into MRI more. All right, what is an MRI anyway? It's a test, of course, and you guys have all had it, right? If you're watching this video, you've had an MRI, so you know exactly what it is. But it, it's a test that your, your doctor orders, uh, and you go to an MRI facility, and it's a giant, noisy machine. And what it does is it cuts your spine up into uh, your cervical spine or whatever they order it on. It cuts it up into pieces, and it cuts it up into pieces in accord with those planes that we talked about. So you get a... Uh, and those... So, they're called series. You get different series. Um, well, let me stay with my slides here. Um, so it cuts it up into the... So you can have axial cuts. Let's, let's do this over. All right, you've made it. So what is an MRI? Let's dig into what an MRI is. And you guys know what an MRI is, right? You wouldn't be here if you haven't had an MRI. Your doctor orders this test. You go to an MRI center, an imaging center. And they put you in this tight tube and they give you earplugs. The machine is so noisy. And that machine makes cuts or slices through the target area. And in our case, cervical spine was the target. And they, they just don't do it willy-nilly. They make slices in the axial plane. They make a whole bunch of slices in the axial plane. All those slices are grouped together into something called a sequence or a series. And then they... Uh, remember the radio, the the technology will say, okay, now this one, now this is going to be four minutes long, and this is going to be six minutes. Those are all different series or se or sequences. They're AKAs for each other. Um, so then they're going to do the sagittal series, and then they say, okay, Mr. Jones, you're doing great. Uh, this one will be another eight minutes, and then they're going to do coronal cuts through your spine. So they're doing all these cuts and all the body planes that we learned. And here's an MRI tube, a beautiful looking three Tesla machine. Um, side note, very important too. MRI technicians, especially toward the end of the day, they can get lazy and they can, they can stop. Uh, you can get a really crummy MRI. Uh, you always, here's a pro tip when you order an MRI, three millimeter cuts. If uh, four millimeter cuts I can live with, but I prefer three millimeter cuts. What's that mean? The cuts are, well, I'll show you in a second, but the cuts are how close the slices are together. You don't want six millimeter cuts because you might have a tumor in between there that you miss or a bone spur that you miss. So you always want three millimeter cuts. You want at least one series to be through the plane of the disc line. You don't want a stack series where or they just go straight down and they don't give you a cut because it can be difficult if you have hyperlordosis or you, can ha you can't see the disc. You can see the disc in pieces. 
Uh, and that's kind of beyond the scope of this, though. But you want one series of cuts through the disc. Uh, and then you always want to try to get a three Tesla MRI. Those are very powerful MRIs that give you good, uh, clear images. And you might warn them that an expert's going to be reading your MRI. And if they're crummy MRIs, I'll be back here and you can do it again right. Because they do get lazy. Case in point, here's a patient who wanted to consult with me. And I always get your images. You don't pay me. Don't send me money until I make sure you're a candidate. Because this patient sent me money before I said it was okay for him to be a, become a client. And I had to refund his money because I, these are worthless. These images are worthless. So here's a pretty good series here. right? You can, see the, you can see the bones and you can see the disc and you can see the spinal cord. What do you make of this? right? He paid $400 for this. This is a, a Florida. Florida, they seem to... I don't want to pick on Florida, but it seems like they have MRI f f centers popping up on every corner there. And some of them don't even bill the insurance. So they charge four or $500, and this is the quality you get, and it's non-diagnostic. I, I can't consult with you if, you if this is what you bring me. Um, so you want to make sure you have good images. All right. Now, f so where do these slices go? Uh, well, I said they're put together in sequences uh, or series. That's an AKA for it. I used to say in series, but they use these two synonymously. But all these slices, like the axial slices, they're put on a disc. And these are, there's, here's two of my latest discs from Stanford, to both of them two from Stanford. And um, Yeah, so that's what you'll get. You shouldn't leave the MRI center until you say, you know what, I'll wait. Can you burn me a disc? I need to take that to my doc. And uh, you wait like five minutes usually. Uh, and they can burn, they might charge you 30 bucks for it or so. Yeah, you should, I know, they never charge me for it. I mean, some of these centers are billing $3,500 to $4,000 for these tests. They can certainly burn you a 25 cent disc. Uh, don't have it, if you're coming to see me too, don't get it password protected. That's a real pain in the rear to deal with that. Okay, um, but yeah, so all these similar slices, like all the axial slices, go in something called a sequence or a series. And those are placed on these discs. And you can read these discs uh, via DICOM viewing software. I use ONUS 2.5, but there's a lot of free software you can use out there to, to view your MRI. Um, and these MRI studies uh, are made up of at least axial and coronal, two, uh, or axial and coronal series. Okay, Some of those will be T1 weighted, some of those will be T2 weighted, some of them will be two, T3, no, not T3 weighted, a proton density weighted, fat saturated, uh, but they'll at least have T1 and T2 weighted axial and coronial series. What T1, what are you talking about? Yep, so there's another categorization system. It's not just axial, sagittal, coronal. Um, there's also, they can set the machine different uh, different ways to give you better clarity and to make certain things highlight and other things not highlight. That's I'll leave it at that. Uh, but the sequences, in addition to being coronal, sagittal, etc., they're also T1 weighted and T2 weighted and proton density. Um, well, I'm just going to focus on T1 and T2 because sometimes that's all I get, especially on these $400 MRIs. Uh, but there's many different types of sequences that you can get. Um, and the sequences also are separated by body plane cuts. So, for example, I'm going to look at your T1 axial sequences. I'm going to look at your T1 sagittal sequences. I'm going to look at your T1 and T2 axial sequences. And when you pop that, you open your, your MRI in your viewing software, you can actually see the sequences uh, right over here. Um, sometimes they'll tell you it's a sagittal and axial, especially on CT. Sometimes they won't. So you have to double click on it and load the image. But if you look at the information here, we have a T1 sagittal sequence. They, this MRI center calls them a series. In fact, this is series number 16 out of 20. All right, so it even tells you the series level of the series. So T1 sagittal series. Um, it actually tells you what cut you're looking at. This is the sixth cut. Sometimes instead of cuts, they call them instants. So this is a sixth instance. But I like to call most people just call them cuts. So you can get a lot of information from your MRI software. Right? So let's look at this uh, 
a full scan of this. So you tell me, is this sagittal? Is this coronal? Is this axial? Well, some of you went, well, let's just go look and see. And there it is. It's sagittal. This is the T1 sagittal sequence 16. It's the same one we just looked at. And you can see it's a side view of the MRI. We know it's a cut right through the middle. How do we know it's a cut through the middle? Well, I can see the spinous processes. Spinous processes are in the middle, so I know this is a mid-sagittal cut. But on your software, you would be looking at kind of the cut line, which guides you, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. All right, so this is a T1-weighted image. This is the first one I think we've really looked at. T1 weighting shows things that have water as dark. It makes them dark. So the cerebral spinal fluid is now dark because it's high water content. The discs are all black because they have water content as well. Um, so that's kind of the story with that. Right? So T1 versus T2. Again, T1 Higher resolution, they're better for looking at for if you want to try to look for fractures. If you want to look at fractures, you really need to see a CT. But if you want to try an MRI, you use the T1 weighted. Um, I use them for uh, contrast, post-contrast imaging, to differentiate reoccurrent herniation from scar tissue. So there's a lot of uses. I'm not going to get into all that. Um, but swelling and inflammation, anything with water will be black on T1 weighting. Uh, tumors are typically black. Cerebral spinal fluid has water, it's black. Nucleus pulsus has water, it's black. T2 weighting is just the opposite. Anything with water like swelling, inflammation, cerebral spinal fluid, nucleus pulsus, that has high water content. So that's going to be white or hyper intense. Right? This is the one for beginners. This is the always look for the T2 weighting. That's you can see the most on that. All right, so let's compare side by side. So here is a mid-sagittal cut. How do I know it's a mid-sagittal cut? There's the transverse process. So it's got to be mid-sagittal cut. Plus I can see, I don't see the pedicles. Because remember, there's pedicles on the side, which would block my view. This is a cut between the pedicles. So I can see the spinal cord. Oh, the cerebral spinal fluid is black. So this must be a T1 weighted. Cerebral spinal fluid is white. So this must be a T2 weighted, and that's exactly correct. But wait a minute, the discs are black. Why is that? Well, these discs are whiter. These discs are blacker. That's degenerative disc disease. Uh, so it's kind of a different... Uh, I, I took all those slides out because it, <laughs> it was like two hours long, the last video I did. Um, so we won't get into that. But look for cerebral spinal fluid. If it's white, it's a T2. If it's a black, it's a T1 weighting. Got it? Okay, look at this. Oh, I, I was supposed to take this out. This is a 15-year-old girl. And some of you, your eyeballs went whoop. This is a lumbar spine. This is the sacrum. Whoa, what in the heck is that thing? Well, it's a big tumor of some kind that's in the sacral canal. If you look on T1, how do I know this is a T1 weighting? Fecal sac is black. So all the cerebral spinal fluid is black. Fecal sac is white. So T2, T1. So this is a, a cyst, something called a Tarloff cyst. Usually not a problem, but in her, it's actually eroding the bone away and compressing the nerves. It's so big, so this is a problem. Um, but that's how you can tell. It's got high water content in it. If this was black, it would be a cancerous tumor. It, now there's, again, I'm not teaching you to read for pathology, but I'd be much more nervous if this was black here and black over here. I wouldn't. That would be scary. But this is filled with water. Okay, MRI anatomy. And I think we're pretty good at this. So we're going to look at this, this cut line right here. Uh, and we're going to talk about the cut lines more in a second. Uh, so whatever I put a cut through here is the slice that I'm going to look at. This is Remember, this is made up of all sorts of slices. There's probably 30 slices that the MRI machine made in this sequence. I guess I could have made that orange, and these should be straight lines. If I want to see this slice, I can't see it. I mean, I can see a little bit of it, but I can't see. I can't. I can't see the whole thing. But if I pull it out and throw it on the table over here, 
and throw it in an axial series, which is giving me a view from overhead, I can see that slice, and this is that slice. And we can see the disc, we can see the uncinate processes, we can see the spinal cord, the cerebral spinal fluid, superior articular process, inferior articular process, facet joints, we can see all that stuff. Right? And I just kind of named what I was going to do. But there's everything I just said. Ended up being the C3 disc, lamina, spinous processes, a facet joint was made by the superior and inferior articular process. Okay? Um, same deal here. So this is a sagittal. It's a mid-sagittal cut. How do I know? Because I can see the spinal cord. And I can see the spinous processes. So vertebral body, there's the disc, cerebral spinal fluid, spinal cord, there's, let's see, posterior longitudinal ligament we haven't talked about. That's getting a little further into the weeds, a little bulge right down here. Uh, spinous processes back here. Uh, we got some epidural fat. We got li uh, interspinous ligament, which is kind of beyond your the scope here. Um, the lamina is right here. Spinous processes here. Yeah, fecal sac. See, you got this stuff. You're getting it. Now we got to understand this cut line. I kind of talked about it a little bit, but that cut line, uh, it's usually orange in color. Uh, that will allow you to select a particular or particular cut in a series. Because remember, the series are all the same type of cuts. They're all axial cuts in a series. And we can select them by putting the cut line through kind of a scout view, if you will. So let's see how this works. So remember axial. So an axial is uh, kind of sawing, sawing a tree. That's, that's an axial cut, but you can't see it. You can make it from standing in front. You can make it from standing behind or make it from standing uh, from the side, but you can't see it. You have to see it from overhead, right? So how do we see these? Well, we pull them out of this scout view and we throw it down in the other view and look at it. So here's the tree. So this is a cut line that this is Onus 2.5, which I recommend. I'm not sure if the company went out of business, but you can still download the free software, which is really powerful. Osirix for Mac people is I think I'm not sure if it's still paid but there's lots of DICOM viewing softwares that will give you a cut line like this so I can scroll up and down when you're coaching with me I will scroll scroll up and down uh, on this this sagittal view or I could scroll up and down on a, a coronal view it doesn't matter but I want to look overhead at your images so specifically I want to see if there's any loosening of these uh, these vertebral body screws in this patient with an ACDF. And so I'm putting a cut right through the screws. I can't see them here, but whatever I cut through here, I can view the cut over here from an axial perspective. Does that make sense? So this is what the cut line shows. And the screws look really good. I don't see any Halloween and they look like they're in good place. See how that works? If I want to put a cut, let's the same patient, let's scroll up here and put a cut right through the, the anterior tubercle and the dens in the posterior tubercle. Well, now this is the cut I see. And I see everything. Here I don't see it because this is just kind of the model. But if I slide this piece out and throw it down so we can look at it overhead in axial view, we see the anterior tubercle, posterior. I mean, we see the entire atlas. It's a beautiful cut. We see the dens. You see the ADI space here. Um, it's a nice looking spinal cord, a nice looking thecal sac. It's a really normal view, a transverse framing, etc. See how that works? Now I don't have to use this sagittal image for a scout view. If I'm if I want to see axial cuts, I could use another similar one. I could put cuts through the coronal view. Uh, and if I put a cut right through the disc space here of C3, I can see it right here, just like before. So you can use the coronal or the sagittal to view the axial slices. See see what that means? Or see the, and that's always under, confusing for people. Okay, I hope you got that. Email me if you don't understand that. Um, but yeah, and again, in my coaching session, I go up and down, we look at every single cut. If there's 20 cuts, I'll look at every single cut through this, uh, through this cervical spine. We'll look at all the axials to make sure there's not a herniation. This one looks great, doesn't it? Uh, there's 
There's huge neuroforamen right here. There's nothing, I don't see any ugly bone spurs coming off the superior articular process or off the uncinate process. There's no bone spurs. I don't see a big disc herniation crushing this fecal sac in. And, and this is a special view, right? This is, normally we don't see cerebral spinal fluid. This is a CT myelogram, which sometimes I have to order it though. If, if people come to me, I get all the hard cases and people haven't ordered these things. Sometimes they have to be ordered and I can catch bone spurs and things that other people don't see because I didn't order them. All right, here's another example. So we're using a sagittal image as our scout image. I have a slice right through the C2 disc. Let's see what the axial looks like. Yeah, it looks really good. There's the same thing. There's the facet joints there. There's the disc, uncinate processes, spinal cord. Looks like a football. The spinal cord should always look football shaped. It should never be long and skinny. All right, I think you got the message. And then the same thing if we slice you up like this uh, in the sagittal plane, which I could do in the coronal plane to make the cuts, or I could go overhead and make these cuts as well. This is what we'd see. So here's a cut. We're using the coronal plane, and we're looking at the sagittal cut. We're looking at this orange cut only. And you can see it's a mid-sagittal cut. It's right in the center uh, between the pedicles. We don't see the pedicles. And yeah, see how that works? Right? Here's another one. I said I could use the axial plane. Let's use the axial plane. So I put a cut right through the center again. And let's look at this cut. Let's throw it over here in the, in the sagittal series. And there it is. And you can see there's the spinal cord again and uh, another ACDF patient and spinal the spinal processes, the spinous processes are viewed, so that tells us it's uh, tells us it's a cut right in the mid sagittal plane. Got it. If I move it off to the side, there's a cut through the the neuroforamen, and so there's the neuroforamen right there. See that? And this is because it has contrast. I can even see the nerve right there. See how that works? Pretty cool. You guys are getting it. There's a cut in an MRI. Well, we, the cut line, I could have put the cut anywhere here, uh, but the cut is right through the middle and there's a mid-sagittal cut. Right, I think you got the, I think you got the picture. Got the story. Coronal cuts. Now we have to stand from the side to put the cuts in. That's the only way you could put these cuts. I mean, you could kind of put them, it's not very intuitively, you could go overhead and put them maybe. But it's best to think, you put them from the side, but you can't view them. You have to stand in front to view them. All right, so let's, let's see. So here is a, from the side, we're making the cuts. Now this is just one. Remember, I could put a cut anywhere. I could look at any of these cuts. But if we look at this cut from a coronal view, this is what it looks like. And we can actually see, we can actually see some little bit of spur formation starting on these uncinate processes. Another two-level fusion. See how that works? Right Now I move the cut line. We took a cut line back through the spinal cord. So, yeah, look, we can see the spinal cord here. Um, we're between, we're in the neural foramen. We're in the neural, uh, vertebral canal, I mean. We're in the vertebral canal. Um, so, yeah, I don't see any... Lamina, I don't see any vertebral body. How come? Well, look where the cut line is. Is it going through the vertebral body? No, it's going through the canal. Going through the vertebral canal. Got it? See how that works? All right. Um, we can use, I said this is kind of not intuitive, but we could use the axial to put those same lateral cuts. As long as we put a cut lateral to medial, lateral to medial to lateral through here. It doesn't matter. It's more intuitive to stand on the side and do it. It's a way to think about it. Uh, but we could use the axial view. So this cut, if I pull this slice out, that's the slice that we see. Okay, this looks like, what, a four-level ACD off in this patient. Let's see the unsinate processes. There's our little dens right there. You got it? All right. So I'm not going to make this right now. Maybe if I get some energy, I'll, 
uh, show me going over an MRI later. I'll make another video on that. But I really think that you have a really, if you've been through, if you made it this far, I think you have a really good idea on how to read your cervical MRI at this point. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, give me a thumbs up. This was really hard making this. I spent like half of my vacation days making this for you. Um, but I, I mean, I enjoy this. I'm nerdy. I enjoy this stuff. So, all right. We'll see you in the next video.